I'm processing an order for my comb top and it occurred to me that I'm looking for feedback and it occurred to me why don't I video myself packing an order and then my spinner viewers will hopefully give me feedback on how they like how I'm doing it. So what I have here is my bag of comb top. It just so happens that I'm packaging the Moret top right now. And one thing I've done, a little hack, is what I've been struggling with trying to manage the size of it, the bulk, is I have a little clip on the back of my old-fashioned chair here to keep the bag open and easy for me to access it. Because <clears throat> one thing I don't want to do, which I think is correct, is I don't want to break the rope. I want one long rope for whatever the weight is that is ordered. All right, I got my little digital scale here with my bowl on it before I turn it on so that it tears it out to zero, which there it is at zero. Then, one thing I've learned to do is I mark the start of the rope with a little piece of paper with holes cut in it. And I was rolling it into a ball at first, but it was twisting the rope and I thought that maybe wouldn't be very nice. So what I'm doing now is I just lay it into the bowl very gently. And I'm just trying to set this so that it's coming off, you know, a little bit more elegantly there. So this order is for two ounces of each color. I'm imagining in my head that this particular person is going to make a, a self-striping yarn. Be cool. So, I'm getting to two ounces. <clears throat> the large intestine that is this pile of comb top here. And okay, so I'm at two. It says 2.05, so I'm going to break it there. 0.06 is where it ends up. And then the other thing I'm doing now is I'm adding an end to the comb top that I'm sending out. And I just take a business card and set it on the end. That way, hopefully it makes it easier for you to find the beginning of the fiber. And I replace mine. And put that away. I still have quite a lot left. But it is moving quickly. And I have a Rhinebeck virtual show next not this coming weekend, but next weekend. It starts on the 15th, um, and I'll be featuring this, so hopefully it finds a lot of nice homes. But this is the amount of brown I have left. I don't remember what I started with. <clears throat> so the other thing I'm doing is, when I did that um, pick at that farm, with that woman that was a fiber person, she had a bag of bags. It's really heavy. This she must have ordered. I think she ordered it from Uline, and the kid said that it was for fleeces. Just a so I didn't buy this. I'm actually taking advantage of her purchase. So what I'm doing is I'm just ever so gently placing. The, I keep on wanting to say roving. Uh, I'm gently trying to place the comb top in the bag and then I'll press out a little bit of air. Now I remember I was at a fiber festival once selling to somebody and she had bought some roving so I was putting it in a plastic bag for her and then I squished it in order to get the air out of the bag and she was like don't bruise my wool. So I'm sensitive to that. I don't know if that's really a thing or not. <clears throat> um, but what I'm going to do now is to use up all the bag is just I do have to squish a little bit of air out. And then use a good old fashioned twist tie from the twist tie stash that I have from when my husband brought home 
boxes of them. My lifetime supply. <clears throat> so that's how I do it. And then when I, I'm going to use this person ordered two ounces of each color. So the bag is actually big enough to hold four ounces of wool. And I split them so that the colors don't mix. Which I don't know if that's, that's a big deal or not. So, you know, that's the thing with me is I've never ordered wool to spin. I've always just gone out and harvested it. And so I've, I would love to get feedback on, you know, is this a good way to do it? Are there other things I could be doing? Um, as you know, I will be sending this person samples of stuff that I'm hand processing so they can sort of get a feel for what it's like by the, you know, the lock, not having been mill processed. But yeah, let me know if you think there's something I could do that would make it better for a spinner. Thanks.
I'm gonna show you how to needle felt a pumpkin using a kit that I have on my shop. And the kit includes a dyed ball of orange wool that has been felted, some brown curly locks with gold tips, block of foam, a felting needle. So that's what comes in the kit. I have a pair of scissors that we're gonna, you're gonna wanna have as the project proceeds. All the pumpkin forms that I have in my shop are different shapes, different colors, so they're roughly all about this same size. The first thing I do is decide how I want my pumpkin to be proportioned, or how I want the pumpkin to be formatted, I guess. Um, I'm gonna make this one a long one. He's gonna be tall, so this is gonna be his base. And because all the wool is evenly distributed right now, what I wanna do is I wanna concentrate the base with wool that's been needled, and what that'll do is it'll give it sort of a weight, kinda of like the Weevils, when you had Weevils toys, the bottom part was heavier than the balance of the, of the toy. So I'm just going to do this, kind of get it a little bit flat with my needle. And the way I hold my felting needle, I'm by no means you know, proficient at this, but I do enough to get by. I keep pressure with my middle finger right at the very top just before the barbs. So this part here is smooth, and right here is where the barbs begin on this particular needle. They have all different kinds of needles. So I put my middle finger just on the smooth part. That way I get the full penetration for this piece. And you wanna be careful with your holding hand that you don't get too caught up in here because you could accidentally poke yourself and that hurts a lot. In fact, I actually use, sometimes I'll use a pliers just to be extra safe and keep my hands that much further away from the needle. When you're not using your needle, just poke it in the foam. You don't wanna have it loose on the table, have it fall off. They're really difficult to find once they get caught, um, set on the floor. Okay, that's pretty good. I'll probably do a little bit more, but you can see that it is now gonna stand nicely. I think it could use a little bit more, but for the purposes of this demonstration, it's good enough. So now what we wanna do is with the brown wool, I want to make uh, grooves where the, you know, when you look at a natural pumpkin, it's got shadows. So we're going to create the fake shadows by using brown wool. <clears throat> and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to snip off these loose pieces of the lock. So if you look at the lock, structure you can see it's really curly and coiled up here we're going to use that for those twisty vine pieces when we make the stem but this loose stuff down here is perfect and ideal to make the shadowed lines the grooves i'm just going to snip it just before it gets spirally because you want to have enough fiber here to needle it into your form for this the spirals I will make sure that you have plenty of the curly locks for what you need to do one pumpkin. So don't worry about it if you accidentally snip a little too much. So now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna just needle that loose brown wool. All right, now this time I'm, it looks like I'm using my fourth finger, my ring finger, and I'm just <clears throat> holding the loose wool with my thumb and forefinger of the non-needling hand and just loosely working that in. I actually don't need the foam for this. And use the needle to direct where you want the wool to go. I've got a little piece of scatter there, so I'm just going to punch that in. I don't normally pick stuff out if I see something I don't like, if you just needle it into the form. These do not come with the kit, but I 
can't see without them doing this stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna grab another piece. Again, I wanna make sure that I keep that as much of the curly bits that I'm gonna wanna use as possible. These are lighter bits of the brown here. I'm not going to worry about that. Nature isn't perfect in its colors, so I like to just sort of let things take their course. If you want to make sure all your colors are consistent, then you can cut it and sort it. Color that's important to you. I'm using my needle to tease the wool out a little bit. See all that scatter? That's it's almost it's kind of like dandruff that you get at the base of the wall, which is probably the reason that I opted to not. Look, and I'm even going to use my needle to just pick up the wool. So I just kind of place the color. Those are a little bit close. One of the nice things about this craft is if you do something that you don't like. So for example, I don't like how those are so close. You just pull it out. So at this point, I'm just placing the color, the darker color, on the pumpkin. So that's uh, a preliminary step. And again, this is just to create that shadow appearance. And I will finish these off doing that same method. And then I'll come back once that's done and we'll take it to the next step. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to needle each each one of these um, lines <clears throat> so that it makes an indent into the sh into the form. So there'll be a groove, a physical groove, not just a, an appearance of shadow, but you're actually going to be creating that shadow. And here is how I do it. Um, once again, holding my needle with my thumb over the non-etched um, part. I'm going to move my curly bits over here for just a minute. And I'm just going to um, needle in and try to get it so that it's in a narrow line. Any dark bits that are outside of that, I just needle them in. And as I'm doing that, you can see I'm creating a tiny bit of a, a little groove there. The needle stays in the wool. I'm not like pulling the needle out. There's a little piece of hay right there that I'm gonna pick off. I have a pair of tweezers on my table that I use. It adds to the appeal, I guess, but sometimes I, I like to take it off. 
You want to have as many etches as possible. pumpkin's got some darker wool on the outside of it. These are not going to be one perfect homogeneous color. They're going to be kind of marbled. <clears throat> Alright, so you just keep doing that. You want to get that row of shadow pushed into the pumpkin as much as you can. And as you're doing that, again, like I said, you're making that groove. So I'm gonna keep doing this. Probably take me about 20 minutes or so. And then we'll come back with the next step. Another trick I wanna show you is your creating your grooves is if you squeeze the two sides uh, that, sur that surround the line, the groove or the line, just squeeze them a little bit, pushes the wool together and it gives you a deeper groove. And the way to keep yourself from poking yourself on the finger is just make sure that the tip of the needle never comes out of the pumpkin form and that way you'll stay safe. Ever so tiny incremental little pushes into the form. Okay, so the, the grooves are in there. Supremely imperfect, as is my preference. And another technique I use to really lay in the groove is I Put the, I start at the base and I stick the, the needle into the form and then I kind of lean it, not enough to break the needle, um, just so that you're taking advantage of all of the grooves on the one side of the needle and just sort of needle your way up and it's just another way to get more of a pronounced groove in your pumpkin form. Again, the point of the needle never comes out of the form. So then also what I do is I needle the center part where all of the, this is where the stem and the leaves and everything are going to connect. But I like to create a little dimple there by needling it very intensively just in the top center part. I don't want to do it too much because I want to leave a little bit of loose wool there to catch some of the, the bits that are going to go in there. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a leaf. Um, I think you saw there I was trying to make sure that it stayed up, stayed upright. If you're still, you can still at this point work at solidifying your base. It might be because some of those brown bits aren't in deep enough and it caused it to wobble a little. Ideally you want a little bit of a flat bottom. So, now I'm going to make, I'm only going to make one leaf and then use a bunch of vines and I also need to make a stem. I'm just going to tease them a little bit to get those curly bits gone. And we're going to be using the, um, the foam form for this piece. So I'm just going to make one leaf and one stem. So this is going to be enough wool to make a leaf. And when I think about the pumpkin leaf, it's kind of like a like a star shape. It's got like four points. 
So I'm just going to bring the loose wool bits into the center so that the ends are all in the center and then work that a little. Use my needle to flex the bits of wool over. focused on making the perfect shape just yet. Right now I'm focused on getting the wool compacted. I'm just putting it in ever so slightly, just enough for like the first or second uh, groove on the needle to do its work. And that's because I don't want the wool to get pushed deep down into my foam. If you push really deep, you're gonna have a, your wool is gonna go quite a ways into the foam and then you won't be able to play with it. This is probably a good time to bring out a tool to prevent yourself from poking your finger. Because I am pulling the needle out. And now I'm starting by going off to the side ever so slightly in an effort to shape a leaf. I'm putting no effort into making this perfect. You can also probably use your scissors to hold it down. really recommend you do this versus holding it with your fingers. This is really fiddly. I'll tell you, this is my least favorite part. And I don't spend any, I've seen people make most beautiful realistic leaves. For me, it's, there's a little piece of grass I'm going to pull on there. For me, I'm okay with it looking a little rustic. I like it though how the, the brown and all of the highlights kind of come together to make it look like a real leaf. So it's gonna have like three point three leaves. This is kind of how it's shaping up. So this is hard. I'm just trying to get a bit of a shape going. Right? So that'll be a leaf. I'm only gonna put one leaf on here. You can make more leaves if you want. Then I'm gonna have some curly bits coming out. Oh, it's getting so cute. And then I have to make a stem now. So let's make the stem. I'm going to take two blocks. Tease them out. You want it to be kind of frazzly and kind of smashed together. It makes the needling better. It's all if the fibers are kind of twisted and mixed up and not straight. So if you're teasing it out. Try to get it. A little bit messy. So when I make the stem, I always try to make sure I leave a little bit of loose stuff at the ends because then that can needle into the form. All right, so I'm going to hold my loose stuff and this is going to be the tip of the stem. What I did was I folded it over a little bit and then I'm going to hold this loose stuff and then I'm going to, this is going to actually needle into sort of a stem. So I'm, but I, the way I'm doing that is just folding it in on itself and needling until I'm happy with what it looks like. Folding it in, folding that top down. And this is, you know, where you can get creative and improve on my method. I, by no means, will call myself. I think I said that already. So I'm gonna pull it off the form. Once again, I'm not going real deep into the foam. 
because again, I don't want to have to pull out the long strands that get stuck in there. Now I do this kind of rolling, twisting thing just to give more structure to the stem. get it to be a little bit thinner at the tip. I'm rolling it now. I've got a nice, now I've got sort of like a firm-ish stem. And again, like I said, the loose bits, those are what you're going to needle in. I'm going to take up some more of these loose bits and put them in the stem piece. And then what I do is I do that same technique where I was using the side of the needle and I use the side of the needle to kind of give more of a, a tip at the top. So you can you could work this for ages. I'm gonna stop here. I think it's sufficient, sufficiently adorable. So I've got my stem. This is extra. I've got a leaf. I could make another leaf, but I'm not going to. And then I've got all these curly bits to put in there to make it look extra super cute. So I'm gonna start with the stem. And I'm just gonna be working those loose bits in. And I wanna kinda make the base of the stem conform to my shadow so that it looks kinda puckered. So I'm gonna kinda bring it in here and bring it out on the stem part. Those loose bits that I So I'm going to needle those more into the groove and then it's not really working out, it's just that's fine. And then I'm just going to needle the base so that it's in there pretty good. Watch your fingers. It's coming out pretty cute. You never know what you're going to get. Well, I never know what I'm going to get. I'm sure other crafters probably do. Okay, good enough. We're getting there. Now I'm going to fix my leaf. I left enough loose, loose wool here that it should go in pretty good. I'm just going to needle it. Oh my gosh, that is so cute. So it's in there. Now my curly bits. And I actually have one long curly bit that I want to use. And then I'll throw a couple shorter ones in there. Take the loose end and needle it in. I'm gonna grab another one. Let's see, look through the ones I've got here. Which ones do I like? bits down here so they don't get caught up in my needling. place them ever so gently. <laughs> I always hate when I make stuff. I think it looks ridiculous. Maybe, you know, maybe I should make another leaf. Okay, I'm gonna make another leaf.
I'm here with Alice Paul, and I wanted to do a sheep evaluation. So I picked Alice Paul, who was named after one of the suffragettes. I picked her because I wanted to demonstrate the importance of a good breeding program. So she is out of Gilly and Knightley, two, two of our homebred uh, animals. And Gilly is out of Nitro and Treviso. Treviso. So we brought in Nitro many years ago because we wanted to, he had really good traits, he had really fine fleece, but he had a great density, good length, and really tiny crimp. And that's what we were really trying to build on. We already had fineness and crimp, but he added some density and length that we didn't have. So when we bred nightly, it was, last year was the first year we used him. He also has many of those properties. He's out of Canterbury and Siena. Again, two, two sheep that we bred. So he's not probably similar length, probably similar length as Nitro. Um, also very good density. He had pretty much a lot of the same stuff, but they were unrelated, so that was the key thing. So one of the cross Nitro with the Canterbury lines. And this is basically the, the sheep we ended up with. So what I like about her is she's an improvement on all of the, I think of all the views that we mentioned before. She's got a very nice conformation, which you aren't gonna be able to see here, good straight legs. She's got wide set back legs, which is something else we were working on. Um, she's got the density of the fleece from front to back. And as we I'll start parting the fleece from shoulder to, to back, and you'll get an idea of what I'm talking about, what we're, what we're after here. All right, so very nice crimp. It's like taupe color, it's a pretty color. Um, those tend to lighten up as they get older. You can see already she's got pretty good length. And she's fighting me every step of the way. Yeah. <laughs> Go to the midside. You haven't really lost any crimp. Uh, also, look at the luster on this one. It's another thing I really like about her. She's got the fineness, the density, the crimp, the length, but also really good luster. That's good right the there. The shininess, lack of scales, very smooth and soft to touch. And that's where you get the handle from. Hmm. If we go back here, it's the hip bone. Still pretty, pretty good. Um, it opens up a little bit, the crimp does, but nothing really to mention. And as you can see where I am, I'm way down into the bridge area which you see how much darker the bridge is. Also really good crimp even into the bridge. <laughs> Gets a little bit longer back here, a little bit coarser as all sheep do. But she's total package really. Uh, very happy with her fleece and overall just her quality is really good. <laughs> Great, thank you. So are we gonna we're not, we don't breed lambs, so no. she, she'll put bread next year. Didn't show her tail, but the tail is also very nice. Got the hair on the tip like you need. Good length, nice tapered, loop shape. Good girl. And she's got a coat normally, we just took the coat off for this purpose. So you need your coat back. And she's spotted, so she shows spots, you can see her spots. Yeah, that's a good point with the spotting. She's one of the, the best spotted sheep we've raised. Uh, Nightly, her father is not spotted. He carries spots, but he's not spotted. Uh, nor has her mother, Gilly. She's also not spotted. But being out of Nitro, we knew she carried spots. And we didn't know Nightly carried spots, but we knew it was possible. So that's what you ended up with. Two recessive genes produced this little beauty. <laughs> One last. Look at this gorgeous. Beautiful. Thank you, honey.